Welcome to Bitcoin Stuff. So I did an interview with Paul Stortz, and if you don't know who that is, he's the person who I think should be running the show around here. Uh, he invented Truthcoin and Drive Chains, and the thing I like about him is that uh, we have similar ideas, only he's way ahead of me, and he's worked out all the details. And he has a plan, and he knows exactly what he wants to build. And he turned one of my God jokes into a tour de force paper, in which he figured out exactly how, how it would work. So he is definitely the person who I am looking for. And uh, I split the discussion into two parts, because originally we were just going to talk about his invention, Drive Chains. Um, but uh, then we veered off into other topics, so that's going to be part two. So uh hope you enjoy. Let's all hear what he has to say. So, uh, you know, I usually do videos on crazy stuff. So now I'm going to talk to a sane person to oh, get no. uh, information from him. Um, and this is going to be about Paul Stortz's uh, invention, Drive Chains. And I pronounced that correctly, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm still learning about Truthcoin. I'm still, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not caught up. So I basically know, know nothing about drive chains. So why don't you just start telling me what, what, what mm -hmm. is the point? Like, what are they for? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So Blockstream had this, so I originally had this prediction markets project, which I'm still working on, but, um, progress on that outstripped that project was supposed to be a Bitcoin side chain, but progress on sidechains was a lot slower than progress on the prediction markets project. So my project, I, I know, you know, it's software is never finished, but I got my project to kind of a pretty good state, like kind of a Bitcoin alpha 0.1 state. And then I looked around and then there was no sidechain technology. So I had to like go back and go down the stack, so to speak. And I was waiting for other people to do the sidechain technology, but they, they really didn't. And so I looked at the Blockstream white paper and I'm pretty sure that almost no one has read that paper because it's very, a lot of people have glanced at it, I think, but it's a very dense paper. There's a lot in it and it's hard to read. And then, so I kind of read it and I thought about it and I thought about what it was really trying to do. And I thought you could do something very similar that was a little simpler because it's, in the sort of game theoretic sense, they're assuming there's this idea of the SPV proof, which basically to block, gloss over a lot of things, just says that in the long run, you can trust the miners to be mining a chain that's in their self-interest. So that's glossing over a lot of stuff. But I thought if you're going to assume 51% of the miners are on your side, then you can do a much simpler thing than what they were doing. And so I turned my attention to that. And so what drive chain is supposed to be is um, a kind of very simple incarnation of side chains. So it's supposed to let you have all the freedom of altcoins, um, but you're still using the same 21 million Bitcoins. And so that's sort of the goal. Um, there's other things, but that's basically the point. That's how the project came to be. And I published it in November, 2015. And you know, you get an ongoing review so um, it's been iterating and re responding to feedback. And then of course, in the process of building it, you encounter all kinds of new questions that you have to solve. So I eventually presented it at Scaling Milan or part of my strategy. I presented a strategy at Scaling Milan, which is that we should have one chain be very decentralized and have a very small block size and be very like locked down and very secure and kind of uh, you could run it over Tor and all kinds of like very, very, very secure. It's kind of like a Mott and Bailey defense, you know, like um, you got this one thing that's like the castle and you hide in there, but then you got this other thing that's, you got these other chains and some of them would be maybe, you know, like a meadow or like a really nice farmland. And you hang out there because it's nicer. But then if something bad happens, everyone just retreats to the castle until the bad stuff goes away. And then when they leave, you go back out to where you want it to be the whole time. Um, and so that's what I presented at Scanning Milan. And then I wanted to, I got a little bit more feedback about that. So I invented this other thing called blind merge mining, which is a much 
Drive Chain relies on this weird kind of shaky assumption, but Blyde and Merge Mining is, a, I think, a pretty cool piece of technology that just doesn't really rely on weird assumptions, just very, very, very safe ones. And that allows, so like Namecoin, as you probably know, it's merged mined with Bitcoin such that it can absorb hash rate from Bitcoin um, without, it doesn't need its own miners. It can just use Bitcoin, piggyback on Bitcoin's miners. And in fact, a very funny thing happened over the last week, which is that Namecoin was absorbing hash rate from Bitcoin Core as well as Bitcoin Cash. And it ended up having more hash rate than either of them alone. So that was a very funny thing that happened with Namecoin. But Oh, wow, look, that is that is great. It is, it is very funny. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the funniest things to have ever happened, I think, in Bitcoin. And so I hope other people got a laugh out of it. Uh, certainly, it's also funny because the hash rate is skyrocketing constantly. Um, so the, each the, all the modern blocks have such a, a tremendous amount of of proof of work that if that that doesn't need to hold up for a very long time. I haven't exactly done the math, but Namecoin could have not only the most hash rate and but also the highest cumulative difficulty because it only takes a few modern blocks that are 20 or 30 percent more difficult to just kind of totally eclipse everything that was done in 2011, 2012, etc. So that would be, could become the heaviest valid chain, which is very funny. But regular merge mining has two problems. One is that the miners have to run software. They have to run the Namecoin software to assemble a valid block before they they do it. They do it. They build a Namecoin block that kind of. It's. I don't, I'm glossing over the details, but they build a Namecoin block that kind of looks like it's inside of a Bitcoin block. And then when they mine the Bitcoin block, they can mine both. But in order to do that, they have to run the Namecoin software, and the Namecoin software is sometimes buggy and it crashes. And then if the miners lose uptime, um, that's hits their bottom line directly, which used to happen a lot because Namecoin was just more buggy than Bitcoin. Um, and also, it's funny. I've heard that from multiple reliable sources that if the mining equipment shuts down, there's so much power flowing everywhere that a lot of the hardware will just start to explode if, they, if it's off and it's not mining Bitcoins. So the energy is just, the energy gradient is just, will just build up. So they don't want this stuff to crash. So that's why even though mining in coin is free, a lot, a lot of people would um, only, you only got like 60% of the hash rate to, Merge mine name coin because even though it was free revenue, it wasn't really free because it was just buggy software. Oh, okay, so let, let's talk about sure. what you yeah. just said in terms yeah. of how drive chains are going to make it easier. Yeah, so blind merge mining, you don't you can merge mine the side chain without actually running the software. So what happens is other people, the nodes over there run the software. And I have an assumption that some of those people who are running those nodes also own regular Bitcoin, which is a very safe assumption because this model here is very asymmetric. So it's very much like a hierarchy with Bitcoin core, core as the root or whatever is the, you know, there's a main chain and that one is kind of the base layer. And then there's side chains off of that, but there's kind of a, there's an asymmetry. So there's like a hierarchy where the one is sort of more important, the Bitcoin core in this example. So, um, what is so? What I assume is that someone who's running Namecoin node also owns some Bitcoin on Bitcoin Core. And what I basically do is I have them pay. They do a special transaction where they say, "I'll pay the miner this amount if they merge mine this Namecoin block." And so they, the person assembles the Namecoin block and pays the Namecoin's sidechain Bitcoin. They pay themselves those transaction fees. And then they're all bidding competitively. Any of the nodes who are interested in doing this um, will bid competitively as long as there's more than two, which are obviously there would be because it's a blockchain um, network. So um, if there's only one, that's kind of pointless. But you, if there, as long as there's a few, they would have this competitive bidding. Um, and then the so the main chain Bitcoin miners would still get the transaction fees. They, uh, but they don't have to do like any of the work. So it's, it was, a because some people complain that like you have like a, some kind of like YouTube side chain or like an ESPN 4k super broadcasting side chain. That's like really, really difficult. It's high bandwidth requirements. So like privacy implications, and they didn't want it to be a case where only large miners 
could merge mine those. So the benefit of this is that the miners don't have to touch any of the software at all. They can just be passively receiving money. Um, so the, so, the side chain so, nodes can pay themselves epsilon. You see, like if there's 17 Bitcoin worth of transaction fees, they can pay themselves 17 and then they can try to bid like 6.8, 6.9. To try and get, they can try and get a little bit, but of course, the bulk of it will just go to the miners anyway, and they don't have to worry about. And so that part I think is kind of cool. But yeah, the point of drive chain is that you send, you're playing with Bitcoin. It's not, it's no longer name coin. It's actual Bitcoin. Um, over on the other chain, you do whatever you want with it over there, and then you bring it back. Um, but yeah, the second benefit of blind merge mining is that the miners get paid. They don't get paid on the side chain. They get paid immediately with the main chain, Bitcoin. That they know and love, so it's a little bit, it's a lot better, I think. Oh, um, yeah, that is better. I, <laughs> I remember once I had this conversation with, um, with uh, Paul Snow, mm. and I, I was saying, I was telling him that, like, you don't, you shouldn't need to create a whole new investment product if you just want to uh, try to, you want to program new rules. And he's like, well, how are you going to pay the miners? And he's like, well, why, why would they want to be paid in a, 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 a worse investment product anyway, if they should be paid in, in Bitcoin, but uh, yeah. So now, now we can do that. Right. So that's, that's the goal of that part. At least that's, that's what we will be able to do if you, you make this thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's, uh, we have a lot of, there's a, you can go to drivechain.info and we have a GitHub and we've done a lot, but there will, in, there just will need to be a lot of kind of review by other people because there's only so much that me and this other guy, Patrick, we have been working on it, but there is only, you know, you can only bring it to a certain point yourself. And then you you always be like blind to you have the unknown unknowns right so yeah other people will have to put in a little effort I think at this at this point but it's mostly finished and in fact I'm considering asking Luke Dash Jr. for the to assign the bit numbers because it's basically we brought it as far as I think we could efficiently bring it so that so we've got we we made it pretty far on both drive chain and blind merge mining so I think that. It's gonna need. It's, it's basically. I don't want to say finished because nothing is ever finished in the world of software. But it's like it's pretty good. There are just a bunch of issues. If people want to go and help with the issues, um, but this the design is sort of stable and the documentation is stable, so that's gonna need. What what is the the GitHub again? Uh, I don't even remember. I think it's drivechain dash project. But if you go to drivechain info, there's a little GitHub icon in the sidebar if you have a desktop or if you have a mobile you have to scroll all the way to the bottom and you get the sidebar and you just click it. I can actually I know what it is right over here. Yeah it is called yeah it's github.com slash drive chain dash project. So uh, okay so so what is so you you said that there is an assumption yes there's a weird uh, assumption yes okay so here's the thing is if the way this works is there's only one way that it can work because if you, the goal is to get a bunch of rules validated, but without actually validating them because you want to create a new set of software rules, you know, have like a new blockchain, so to speak. And, but you don't want to have Bitcoin core do the work. So that's, the, that's kind of this, this paradox that you're stuck with if you want to do a side chains like thing, right? You want to let people go into a different zone where they um, have new rules. So maybe it's a larger block size. It could be, it could be anything. But then when the payments come back, if there's some kind of dispute over, oh, that's not who owns that coin. Does, does A own it or does B own it? Then you have to have some way of resolving the dispute. So so that's the paradox is that you don't, you don't, you can't actually check who, who owns it, A or B, but you need to check something. And so it's kind of an un, unalterable, you know, um, this is kind of just a paradox, but it's a trade off like anything else. So what I do is I say, I make it so that the side chain has to report on exactly what it's doing uh, at all times. And then when it wants to, to transfer money out of the side chain back to the main chain, it has to do this very, very, very slowly. 
And the reason that this is not inconvenient is because meanwhile, people can do these atomic swaps back and forth. So I don't think anyone would actually use this to be like an industrial process. It's possible that only the miners would actually do this. But the, the point is these, when you want to send, so when you want to send money to the side chain from the main chain to the side chain, it's very simple because I assume that the side chain is watching the main chain. And I obviously assume that the main chain is working correctly. So that part is easy. Um, so going like, so there's only like one leg of the problem that is really hard, which is having the money come back. You know, you send the money into factum side chain and then you do something with it. And then you want to send the money back. Now, Bitcoin core can't check the rules of the side chain because this breaks the, this breaks the goal. The goal is to, to not to avoid doing all that and just let other people do whatever they want and not have it affect Bitcoin core. But at the same time, you want some guarantee somehow that this money is going to end up in the right place. And so what I do is I say all the transactions coming back from a side chain, they're all batched up into one uh, transaction. And then that transaction is, you know, has an ID, it's hashed and it's sort of frozen in place. And then everyone gets to examine it for a very long period of time. And I suggest, this is a configurable parameter, but I suggest like one month of it just sitting there. <laughs> and then it's slowly act, acknowledged or non-acknowledged. It's sort of like miners like upvote it or downvote it once per block. And if it achieves enough upvotes over another length of time, which I think should be like two months, then the payment goes through in Bitcoin Core. And the side chain's watching, so the side chain knows when Bitcoin Core is sending money to it, so then it can just credit people. And it knows when the, the the side to main withdrawal transfers, it knows when those have succeeded. So then it knows to just destroy that money, to stop locking it and just destroy it. It's because it got successfully transferred out. So the basically to put a bottom line on it, the threat is that miners can, if, if you have these things, let's say you have a Bitcoin core and then you have like a large block side chain that which is like something that people are interested in these days. So you have this side chain that has, it doesn't matter, a 20 megabyte block size or something. And there's a total of 2000 Bitcoins over there or whatever, whatever the case may be. This is like, we have about, I don't, I, I looked it up, but I can't remember. We have about four and a half million or 5 million or four and I think four and a half million Bitcoins that have not been mined. And so there's 16 million on Bitcoin core. So there would be some on other, these other chains. And the threat is that miners would create a transaction that pays all of the side chains money to themselves and then they would broadcast it and then we would wait a month and then they would all acknowledge it to themselves and then the withdrawal would go through and they would get on the main chain they would open the side chain uh, account and give themselves all of the money so that's the threat and the only way i found to kind of defend against it um, is to make sure that it's very obvious in advance and that it's very slow and that it's very easy to check. So it'd be very easy to check the attack because the side chain broadcasts what it's supposed to be, what, what's supposed to be being withdrawn as just a little hash. And then on main chain Bitcoin, you can see what's being withdrawn and that's a little hash and you can just see if they match or not. And of course the uniform numbers and they're only 32 bytes long or whatever. So they're very easy for a human being to see immediately that the rule, the rules are not being followed, the kind of meta rules. Um, and it's very easy for miners to comply with the rules because they themselves can check because it's just a little hash. And it's also very easy for miners to kind of pull this alarm and just say, we're going to unacknowledge everything and we can, they can downvote everything until we, they figure out what's going on and just kind of slow the process down and say like, we don't know what's going on, but we'll figure it out later because something is up. Um, and so that is kind of all the stuff that I threw in the way. Uh, but yeah, this is the major kind of empirical question. Um, I think if this doesn't work though, I think nothing will work because I don't really see how it can get much better than this. Like, I guess you could ramp the parameters up a lot and you could say it's got to wait for two months and then it takes an entire year to be withdrawn. Um, and you can kind of hope that that doesn't matter because again, people can already do these atomic swaps among the among two different chains and you just, what you want is for people to do them at an exchange rate that's very close to one so that it's effectively the same token and 
and then you want to do this basic accounting, which is very easy to do to make sure there's never any more than 21 Bitcoins that, that aren't permanently locked somewhere. Um, so, so a lot of that's easy, but yeah, I think if this doesn't work, then nothing will work, which would be kind of a shame. But basically the security model is that what would be implied if miners steal from the side chain is that they have to do this intentionally and kind of obviously. So what it would imply is that uh, the price of Bitcoin should go down, I think. So if the side chain is popular and if people like it, then, and it, you know, they're losing all the, the side chain is going to provide its own transaction fees, first of all. But second of all, it's going to provide more utility for Bitcoin. So it should be increasing the value of Bitcoin. And so destroying it should decrease the value of Bitcoin. And it should also kind of put an end to the entire side chain experiment because they can say, well, they're going to attack this one side chain. So they're probably going to attack them all, which means we can't have any now and we can never have any in the future. So that's kind of the, the, the consequence or the, the threat or the kind of the equilibrium, the equilibrating force is that the idea is that if they were, if miners were to attack a side chain, it would take a long time. Um, there's a lot of ways for it not working. And if it, even if it does work, it should just harm the miners bottom line because investors should just say, well, I guess we're stuck with only one chain and only one development team forever instead of having, you know, a kind of like freedom and permissionless innovation. So that is kind of the model. The other thing is, of course, I mean, I don't want to rely on this, but the other thing is people that might like if they're it, once you're it maybe you're if this is a three month thing, as I've been saying. So if you're like two months into those three months and it looks like the miners really are going to steal, people could just hard code. That's part of the reasons we're making it so slow is that people might just say, well, we're going to do the user activated soft fork type thing. And we're just going to say, we are not going to let this transaction in the block. And, you know, and, and then, you know, there's other things too, like if the miners really misbehave, then people, you know, there's always the threat of the proof of work change and other things. So I, my personal opinion is that the miners are more docile and other people don't have that opinion, but I think they're just normal people trying to make a living. And I think that, side chains will increase the value of Bitcoin. And then eventually it'll reach a point where mining can only stay profitable if they never attack any, any side chain with the exception of like weird side. It is, I think it is possible to build like weird side chains that try to harass other chains, like a chain that only pays you if you like fork a chain or something like that. And so I want miners to attack those and just and clean them out. In fact, I have a giant presentation on this that I called side chain privatization which is sort of like I want miners to kind of like own and curate the portfolio of side chains just so that no one ever bothers. See what I don't like, I really don't like um, kind of the Ethereum idea that you can just run whatever you want and they can't stop you because I think that you will end up with some guy coding in secret, some weird thing and he'll code it and then he'll put it out and then they, they won't, it'll be like cat and mouse. You won't be able to stop it or something like that. So I want this thing that I call categorical control. I want the miners to be able to say this category of smart contract, we don't like, and we're getting rid of it. We're filtering it out. Yeah. So I like that. Well, yeah, I, I'm kind of, uh, I, I kind of think it's silly how, how paranoid people can be about the miners too. Cause you know, the miners are sort of, they are subject to forces that are beyond their control, which is yeah, sure, the, the, the value of Bitcoin. And if they try to, um, act maliciously, they harm the value of Bitcoin. And, you know, that that harms the value of their equipment. So I think yeah. that there's some pretty strong constraints that will tend to keep them honest. So, so everything you said sounds reasonable to me. Right. And so that's really all the bad news. The good news is that you can do now, you know, the good news is pretty good, I think. So I think even if you're a very pessimistic person, the good news is that you can now just create whatever weird experiment you want. So you can do, you can do like an Ethereum side chain, although I don't think it will, it's a good idea, but you can do that. You can do a weird proof of stake. If you're not, if you don't want to do the blind merge mining part, the first part, drive chain, the hash rate escrows, you can do like whatever weird stuff you want, proof of elapsed time. 
You can do all this weird hyperledger stuff. You can do like an R3 thing. You can do like whatever weird stuff you want. You can put Bitcoin into this account that is only withdrawable if after a very, very slow time. And so you have basically totally arbitrary control over what kind of weird chain you want. You can make all the mistakes that you want with all the terrible developer talent that you want, right? And so like, what's better than that? This is so it totally turns the, um, the tables, I think, on the entire way that we do things in Bitcoin right now, which is that yeah. right now we have a kind of, I have, we have like a kind of, um, I'm not really sure what to call it. It's like a USSR Ministry of Science or something. We have it all like going a, through. He like hegemony. A, yeah, we have a, yeah, we have, exactly. We have like a hedge of money. And um, yeah, I so love mistakes. Here. This is kind mm -hmm. of like a, a common theme in arguments that I have with people is that you know, they, well, there's just a lot of concern trolling that goes around in Bitcoin. And I always say, so just, you know, just do it and see what happens. Yeah, there's, you I know? think I've noticed, haven't you noticed, I think, I'm sure you have, there's like a very much like an anti Hayek kind of streak running through the entire philosophy of Bitcoin right now, which is very funny. Because Hayek was all about just like, just try whatever, something will fix it somehow, the anti fragility. But yeah. Now it's very like, we have to protect people from being confused. I know you did a video about that. This is like, we have to protect uh, yeah, I, so, yeah, I'm, I'm and, just trying to cause confusion and uh, create uh, chaos so that they have to deal with it. Because I know that the only way to, to deal with it is uh, a, a, a different philosophy, the one that's more, more like mine. Yeah, more, more Hayekian. So, but I have another point about the miners, which is that I think I've noticed a kind of I've noticed a kind of separation uh, in philosophies that, and some of them cover different aspects of Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin is a really big, complicated thing. And I think there is like a kind of difference between uh, like a cryptographer point of view, and then there's like a economics game theorist point of view. And there's kind of, it's basically about how much they value independence. And the cryptographers, I think, they want total independence in a strict like science statistical sense. Like they want to build a safe that cannot be opened unless you have the password, even if you have a computer the size of the sun or whatever other weird stuff, right? They want to say like, this is totally ironclad. Like there's absolutely nothing anyone can do. It's completely unbreakable encryption, blah, 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 blah. But the, the other extreme is that you kind of, it's sort of more of the economics thing where it's like, well, I'm going to go down the street and I'm going to buy some lunch. And I don't know what they're putting in that lunch, but I've eaten there for years and it tastes okay to me. And there's some pro somewhere, there's some process that if they do something bad with the lunch, it, someone else will like fix it or something that someone will get bad press or the, someone will call someone and complain and something will be in the media or something like that and they'll just go out of business eventually and someone else will take that spot because they won't be able to afford rent and so game theory is all about interdependence it's all about like everyone's pointing a gun it's like a mexican standoff a mexican standoff is like game theorist approved it's like a plus because <laughs> it's like perfect it's like perfectly balanced you know and yeah you're like, i love it and then the, but the cryptographers are like, oh, what if what if they go crazy and, and shoot us? That's kind of like the miners versus developers, I think. There's the Mexican standoff. And I'm fine with it. I love it. I think it's fine. It's Oh, well, why don't we have a Mexican standoff sometime? Well, when we get when we get together yeah. in uh <laughs> in uh the in February, we can yes. we can have our a Mexican standoff. I think we can have them with think... ourselves or with or with other we you and I well, with <laughs> other people. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna who... I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell uh, Bruce Fenton about that idea because I think he'll he'll like it. Yeah. That would, that would actually would be funny if he organized it as like a an event. You like okay, yeah, no, over I, here. Think, I think like, that he would like that idea. Blockers, so supporters of side chains over there, some lightning <laughs> network supporters over there, and then then we all have super soakers or something, you know. And it's just like I don't know, I don't know where yeah. that could go. It could go a lot of ways though. That's that's very funny. Uh, yeah, no, I mean I I always think that. Yeah, to me, like well, people this will okay. people will act to preserve the value of their investment, right? Yeah, and it's a little incongruent that, to start Bitcoin mining and then become a crazy person. But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of how I feel. Like 
like what I'm doing now. Like if, if, if I thought everything was going fine, I, I would not have started my YouTube series. I would have just, you know, done something unrelated to Bitcoin. Uh, well, see, that's but, kind of what I was trying to say is that in the thing that I sent you and I said, I had a lot of fun with it. The, I have the part where I do the, there's this normal like game theory grid, but I just drew like a tangled line. And I was like, yeah, the people have all these incentives to like kind of interact in the horrible ways um, because they think they can persuade people to do this. So a lot of this stuff is crazy, like all this Twitter stuff and all this kind of like, yeah, people get harassed and, um, you know, people get all kinds of threats and things. And then people are com feel compelled to make start a YouTube series. And all this stuff is kind of this big result of, of not having good interactions. And it would be nicer if we just had a world where if you wanted to do something else, you just did it. And Bitcoin Core is like the Linux kernel. And it, I would ideally, I don't think it should change. I don't think that, I think Bitcoin Core should really stop changing very much. It's, I think it's, it's too easy to change with a hard fork or a soft fork or anything. And I think we should establish a precedent where Bitcoin Core doesn't change as much. And instead, other weird things change. All the layer two side chains, lightning, all this other stuff should change a lot. Businesses that use Bitcoin. Um, but I think we are, I think we have already demonstrated all that so much about Bitcoin can be changed with just a few people, um, just the developer vote or only the mining vote or only something. So I'm not, not happy about that. And I don't like all this interaction it's not organized. So I think it would be better. This is part of the big upside. So this is why I'm very passionate about the experiment, the sidechain experiment. I think we should run it and we should see what happens. And um, I think it's interesting, this, this, this dichotomy I mentioned before about like cryptographer versus game theory is that a lot of people who are great cryptographers um, didn't believe in Bitcoin and they didn't think it would work. And they would say things like, well, the miners will just uh, reorganize the chain and take everyone's money. And, and Greg Maxwell has that proof. He had like a mathematical proof that it wouldn't work. Um, I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think I haven't actually looked at it myself, but I think I can guess where he probably the where Satoshi kind of cheated on his proof is that I'm pretty sure that Satoshi is printing new money and giving it to people with these blocks, the 50 Bitcoins per, blocks, per block in the first four years. And the idea that those could have value, and this is something that I think you discussed with Chris also recently, the idea that those could have value and that they could be fuel for this machine, I think that's like the new game changer that he put in, that it wouldn't be possible unless people were willing to, they were willing to pay money for the, these 50 Bitcoins that were created every 10 minutes at first. Um, and so I think in a weird way, it's funny because you think something is like a mathematical proof, but it can be in practice, it can be overturned because, um, because governments manage the currency so badly <laughs> because people want, so it's this very weird. Bitcoin is like a big thing that it's got, it's plugged into every weird facet of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, wait, wait till you see yeah. my, my next, my next video. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. So, um, so can you go, let's go into some more details about how, how the drive chain is going to work. So do we have, do we have an address, a, a, a yes. normal Bitcoin address? And that is the, the drive chain. Yeah. So for user experience and, and laziness reasons, there currently is like an address that's a little more like, you know, normally in Bitcoin, the addresses are not like accounts, but in drive chain, they are. So it's kind of complicated to explain, but that's basically it right now. You can deposit Bitcoin to this. If you send it to this address, then anyone who's running the sidechain software will know, they'll, they'll hear about it and they'll know just either from over the network protocol or just by looking at the Bitcoin blocks because this is an asymmetric design where it's more like plugins where I assume that everyone is running Bitcoin Core and then 
you can kind of like check a little box. Do you want to also run this or that or nothing? Um, and so they kind of, they're aware of what's happening in Bitcoin Core. And so when you deposit to this little box, you get credited automatically. So it's like when you send, you would send Bitcoin to the side chain and that would be one of your outputs is that you're putting the Bitcoin into the side chain, but then you'd have this, some other thing. And right now we have it as your basic kind of op return um, thing and you push another address in there. Uh, and then the sidechain watches that transaction and says, oh, that person deposited 14 Bitcoin or whatever. And then here's the up return. And so we are going to credit that address over here with 14. That it will sort of, it will sort of print, but it's not, they're going to be destroyed when they go back. So it's just accounting. But yeah, it doesn't need to, since you have infinite flexibility with the new piece of software, that is how that works. And then once you're over there, you can do whatever you like including open a payment channel um, with people. So you can lightning, you can use lightning network within a chain, but also across multiple chains, as long as they have the same hash function, which they all will. So, uh, so that's kind of neat. And also it's, I think it should be possible that um, it should be possible to charge more. Like someone should be able to send money over to side chain, open a bunch of channels there and then charge more for that hub per like a variable cost, charge more per transaction in that hub than maybe on main chain Bitcoin core. And in that way they would get kind of a return for putting the, the risk of putting their money in this new thing. And then people could lightning through them. If there's some, if this is assuming that there's some weird smart contract that only the side chain can do. That wouldn't really, I don't know if that would really work for payments because the point of payments is that the merchant has to get but maybe it would because if you had like something like um, BitPay or something that was on the side chain, then so it's kind of neat. So there's a lot of flexibility. So lots of stuff to uh, figure out um, for like, you know, actual economic agents to figure out how they are going to use it the best. But um, I think the first in practice, the first thing I would like to do is have just a side chain that just has a larger block size because I think people would really like that or that people would be interested in using that and it would also would be very 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 easy you know what i would like to see i would like to see a side chain where you have to do proof of work to make every individual transaction then that determines the bandwidth not not some arbitrary number because I, I think that that was a design flaw that uh, satoshi put in into bitcoin you should actually have to do because that's what we do in um in bit message you have to do proof of work to send a message into the network at all and the whole point of uh proof of work is to prevent spam so uh but anyway uh <laughs> yeah i know i like um i well i like that's funny you mentioned that because i like the idea of a see bit message i think does yeah i like bit message i would like to see i would definitely like to see like in kind of email uh, side chain. So what you're talking about, you're talking about kind of two different things, but you're saying like, is there a better way of doing proof of work, which is the transactions proof of work, um, which is kind of neat. Um, I don't know. I think you, there are, I think there were some like Dan Larimer tried to do something like that, but he didn't do it very well or something. And he called the transactions as proof of work or something in 2014. Or, but aside from that, I would like to see some kind of messaging side chain or something. And instead of doing the proof of work, you can do the actual, you can do the real thing, like the post converted proof of work, which is that you can, you can charge people Bitcoin to send you money. And I know 21 does this, but they are a company and I don't want them reading my email. So, yeah. uh, or even knowing who I talk to. So, and plus, you know, their, their original idea was so bad. I don't know if I trust them doing anything now. I just, uh, an absurd idea of the, of, of putting a miner in, in like everything and like a light bulb, like, was that real? Like, did I hallucinate that? And then they changed it to like the computer 21, the Bitcoin computer. And then I was like, yeah, a lot of people are having a lot of trouble. They use like these hardware metaphors. This is a very common thing in the whole, like starting up a Bitcoin business. A lot of people like, don't like, you know, like, like Balaji, a regular computer is a, a Bitcoin computer. Like, like, what are you talking about? So, a lot of like weird stuff is going on. Um, people are figuring out how software works. 
a second time, I guess. And well, it, it almost seems like most of the ideas in Bitcoin are like random, like randomly generated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's very Hayekian, right? They're just like, we don't know anything. We have no theory. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's a disappointingly Hayekian. It's like, we, it's just a slime mold. We have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll, just, we'll just proceed in all directions at once. And well, part of it is that this is a really interesting effect that a lot of people want to, a lot of people are misled by the blockchain without Bitcoin meme. And it got so much emperor's new clothes, like kind of credibility from everyone. And then well, I remember it was 2016, you had like Larry Summers talking about it. And then the governor of Delaware was like trying to make Delaware the blockchain state. Was something crazy. Well, and, and, and also crazy. nobody understands why Bitcoin is valuable. Okay. Right. So there's no, it's just, it's like the blind leading the blind. So you can just create mm -hmm. all of these new blockchains and that have like almost no difference between them, them and Bitcoin and they, they can make tons of money. And so then there's tons of incentive to just paper yeah. over, to, you know, the what I'm saying is that who's like getting really like, why is it such, why is it doing a slime mold thing? I think the investors are just like, you know, institutional investors with us dollars, just like pouring money into these companies and they just, they think you can do anything and they, or they don't know or they don't know what they're doing and they're just like kind of buying options or something and they're just like they don't know there's no theory um so that's a very bizarre thing that's happening that was part one stay tuned for the chilling conclusion